Coming up on Digital Music Trends 171 on the 20th of February 2014, Yahoo's AV8, the Brit Awards and Twitter Amplify, the Spotify IPO rumors, V-Contact, Dingana's demise, the iTunes Festival heads to South by Southwest, and much more. DMT's coverage is brought to you by CI, the delivery platform used by leading independent labels, distributors and aggregators around the world on ci-info.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. DMT is available as an audio and a video show on a variety of channels including the iTunes Store, most podcatching apps including Downcast, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio and AudioBoo. To get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at Trends or email us on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. As you've seen in the intro of this week's podcast, uh, you know the show is brought to you by by CI, which is a leading provider of digital delivery services uh, to the independent community. So go and check them out. They're supporting the show on ci-info.com. And this week, it's a real pleasure to have two great guests on the show. Uh, first up, Neil Cartwright from the digital marketing company Million Media. So Neil has extensive experience from digital uh, in digital marketing, working in the industry with a long list of past and present clients, which includes Jamiroquai, Channel 4, Medium, Ministry of Sound, and many more. So hi, Neil, and thanks for joining us. How's it going? It's going very well, thank you. It's great to have you. And uh, also, it's a real pleasure to welcome for the first time uh, on this show, uh, Tony Himes uh, from the music startup Wide, uh, where he is community manager. Tony has been a super active listener of DMT for some time, so really looking forward to having him on, having him on the show. So, hey, Tony, how's it going? Good, man. Really good. It's cool to be here. It's great. And, and I need to remember to breathe today. It's been a very long week already. <laughs> so <laughs> I've made myself an Irish coffee just to try and help thing, uh, ah, things good. through. That should be good. And so uh, this week, uh, you know, I want to start with uh, uh, a bit of an off the wall story. And then we're going to get into, you know, the stuff that we have to cover, like, for example, uh, the Brit Awards and the South by Southwest and, uh, you know, the iTunes Festival that's going to happen in Austin. But first of all, I want to talk about Yahoo because we don't talk about Yahoo very often on the show. And uh, uh, I want to talk about them because uh, um, the startup that they acquired called uh, uh, Aviate, uh, which they acquired uh, um, uh, at the beginning of the year, has uh, announced an interesting uh, product as part of its app. So Aviate is essentially a skin that you put on an Android phone. Uh, there's a lot of these apps that essentially take over your phone and, and uh, do some really cool things uh, when it comes to the home screen. So Aviate is one of those. It's not uh, actually publicly available yet, but uh, uh, what the company has uh, released now as part of its beta is a feature that detects when headphones are plugged into the phone and uh, uh, essentially brings up uh, uh, the relevant music app that the listener uses on the phone or suggests a number of apps uh, to use. And also uh, it can detract what it can detect what track is being played via Spotify, for example, and uh, present users with a number of contextual information uh, like uh, artist biographies, YouTube videos and and more uh, while the song is playing. So uh, an interesting proposition here, uh, you know, I, I really I'm interested in seeing how this is going to do when it comes out to the wider public. Of course, of course, there's a bunch of different skinning apps for uh, Android. Uh, the same uh, can't happen on iOS because it's much more locked down, but uh, uh, definitely a big audience out there for Android. So, uh, Neil, on your side, uh, do you think that uh, users uh, would appreciate something like that, something that makes uh, the experience of consuming music a little bit more uh, pop-up, in a sense, uh, a bit more uh, direct? Yeah, I, I, from what I can see, it looks like a fantastic application. I really like the idea of drilling down and presenting you with all the information. I particularly like the thought that it was contextual as well. So it can look at your browsing habits, uh, predict or recommend new sites for you to take a look at. I thought that was really cool. Why Yahoo uh, getting behind it? Not sure. Uh, whether they're a good partner, how much they paid for it? Not sure. Um, are they going to charge for this? Um, is it going to be a free app? There isn't really that much information yet. Yeah. Um, but but all said, it, it strikes me as well as very much like um, the Facebook um, open graph, you know, just yeah. the, that's on the right hand side anyway. So as you're listening to things, um, that that pops up with information about who's listening to what. Um, it's 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 um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I think it looks good. And Tony, this kind of strikes me a little bit as, as an alternative to Google now as well, in a sense, uh, uh, because of what it does. So do you think that uh, there's still more to be done when it comes to uh, making uh, music, uh, uh, you know, getting music to the forefront of people's experiences on mobile devices? You know, we always look at weather and uh, stock, stock information and meetings, but music has really not been integrated that much in these sort of applications yet. 
Yeah, you know, it seems a little bit like uh, iOS 7 on, on, on the iPhone where you flip up the little control from the bottom and you have the kind of thing. Uh, you know, it's, to me, it seems like a kind of a shortcut yeah. uh, where you plug in the headphone. And, and, and of course, if you're going to have the headphones and normally you listen to music, it's going to be great. But I don't know. I think it's going to still be limited, at least for the short term, to people who use their phones already for music. Right. Um, I don't think it might really change anyone because you still have to integrate Aviate into your own phone yourself. So... Yeah, I think it's only going to be the music fanatics, at least the people like us. You know, it's going to be great for us um, and, and for us to be able to access you know, all the information we want about bands. You know, people kind of can do that. Like you mentioned with Google, you know, you go to a Google search and now you see the relative discography and things on the side and the information. Uh, so it seems like Aviate is sort of kind of aggregating that information together and eliminating the step of you having to actually search for it when you're plugging your headphones. So. Yeah. Uh, it definitely makes the experience a little bit better for people who, who use it. I don't know how well the contextual... Um, the part will work, but for people who have strong habits, maybe that could be just a nice little yeah. extra benefit for them too uh, during the day. So uh, yeah. it might have a little bit of trouble getting off the ground for people who don't already use their phone heavily for music, but eventually for those people, it could be, it could be a very good addition. Yeah, sure. And I mean, uh, from what I understand, AV8 is also looking at all sorts of stuff beyond music. I think it does a lot of integrations mm -hmm. uh, uh, on uh, in news and uh, other things. So maybe that could be interesting for people that are not really interested in music, but find this popping up when, they're, when they plug their headphones in and uh, they get that added layer of, a layer of experience on, on the application but again you know there's a lot of skinning apps on Android I don't have an Android phone myself but I think there's a lot of competition on the front Facebook have got their own as well as a skin uh, for Android so it's just going to be a question of seeing how many people actually are, are bothered to use these skins and, and how many are going to adopt it. Uh, and of course, you know, we have to uh, talk about the Brits. Uh, you know, the Brits happened last night. Uh, I haven't asked you guys previous to the show whether either of you have seen them, but uh, anybody seen the Brits last night? Of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, I didn't see the Brits uh, award show last night. No. Yeah. Uh, so uh, essentially, you know, it was uh, the usual Brits, you know, uh, not too many surprises, to be honest. Uh, it was uh, the last uh, awards, uh, the last time that they were going to be hosted by uh, James Corden, who is a, a sort of a personality comedian here in, in the UK. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they, they went off without much of a glitch, uh, to be honest. Uh, there were performances by uh, the usual massive uh, mega stars. It kind of felt like a bit of a replay, actually, of the Grammys, in a sense, because uh, Katy Perry played and uh, Shashu played the same song she played at the Grammys. Uh, Beyonce played and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ellie Goulding played out as well, which was good. Uh, she didn't play at the Grammys. Or, or did she? I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, so the, there were a bunch of performances. It was quite good. Uh, Neil, what were your thoughts on, on the Brits um, in terms of a uh, show as a whole? Well, as ever, it lives under the shadow of what happened, you know, 25 years ago with the notorious Sam Fox and Mick Fleetwood. And they've never lived that down because every show goes without a hitch every year. And yet it still lives under this, oh, what's going to go wrong? Is it going to... It never goes wrong. It's, it's a very, very slick professional production. What I was uh, slightly, uh, well, I wasn't personally upset, but what surprised me, when I was at Sony, we were always told it was the performances that really uh, increased sales. You know, it, it wasn't so much winning the awards that, that sparked interest. Um, the sales spikes the next day were always for the performers. And last night was very notable that the majority of performers were, were non-British. Yeah. Um, if you count them up, uh, Bruno Mars, Katy Perry, Beyonce, Pharrell, William. Do these people really need the exposure? Do they really need uh, presenting to the British public? I would like to have seen Rudimental. You know, I, some of the bands that were being... I mean, Rudimental played, but they, yeah, they were kind of... Well, they picked up their award. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted them... It would have been good to, to give them the stage. Um, so... Yeah, why put these big US acts on as the live performers when the whole thing I thought was meant to be about the Brits? Yeah, and uh, no, it's it's an interesting point of view, and uh, I think uh, uh, it was uh, it was it's it's kind of interesting to see how much uh, the the big mega stars will have a a lot of weight at the award ceremonies. But of course, you know, uh, the Brits represent also the majority of the British buying public's uh, guests. Uh, uh, opinions and, and purchases over the past year so I guess it makes sense to have those mega stars. but uh, you know seeing somebody plug their single twice like Katy Perry both at the Grammys and at the Brits with the same song at least you know Beyonce changed track and she played a track yeah. that she hadn't played before uh, I mean uh, Katy Perry had a very different stage outfit I think uh, at, at the Grammys it was like a witchy type uh, uh, witch type thing and, and here it was the same track yeah, but with an Egyptian 
theme. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it was definitely an interesting an interesting night. But uh, uh, I, I want to talk about the technology side because uh, there was uh, one interesting story that came out last week uh, around that, uh, which was uh, the fact that uh, uh, the uh, brand uh, uh, styling brand uh, V O Five, which uh, personally I'm t- I know nothing about style, I never heard of before. <laughs> uh, they they partnered with the uh, Brits uh, uh, to make use of Twitter's Amplify uh, program to increase uh, engagement uh, on the network. So uh, this consists of a series of snippets of videos that were captured from the live feed, essentially, of the TV broadcast and put straight into this uh, uh, sort of Amplify program uh, as tweets uh, that were uh, playable right within uh, Twitter. Uh, they also had the pre-rolls and and, and uh, uh, those were pre-rolls uh, advertising uh, VO5 uh, because the company was sponsoring this uh, activity. Uh, it was a little bit intrusive, actually. 10 seconds was quite a long time for, for a short clip. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, essentially, it's, it's a way to activate the audience uh, even more. Um, I, I don't know. What, what do you think of this experience? Uh, Neil, did you come across any of those tweets uh, uh, during the night? Do you know, I was watching it and I, I didn't. Um, I, was, I was doing my dual screen. I had, I had my Twitter feed. Um, I didn't see any of them. I, I, I must have missed them. I didn't see it in the sponsored section. Um, I think it's a great idea. Uh, Twitter obviously have to figure out ways of making money, and this seems like a really innovative way. It's engaging for the audience. If they're watching and they're interested in what's on screen, then to have these little snippets of information as additional pieces of content sounds great. But I I miss them. I didn't yeah, see it. Uh, me too, actually. I, this morning I had to, I knew about the story. I knew this was happening, but I didn't see anybody, all the people that I follow retweet or I didn't see any promoted tweets around that. Maybe, uh, I, maybe I'm not VO5's target customer yeah, either. Maybe it's so smart that it just said, look, Neil's <laughs> never bought a VO5 in his life. and <laughs> He doesn't know what it is. Like, waste that money. It. So, yeah, yeah that's, maybe that's it's it. really smart. <laughs> and and uh, Tony, uh, you know, in, in the UK, uh, um, the next web reports that uh, this was the first time that uh, 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 there was a campaign that was uh, uh, you know entirely dedicated to the UK on Amplify. There were other campaigns that happened before, but they were sort of only partially targeted at the UK with this uh, with this new service. Uh, have you seen anything like that happen in France? And what's your take on this uh, sort of short form uh, uh, rebroadcast on Twitter? Well, I'd, I'd heard some of this about it uh, back when they did some of the first ones with Coke Zero, I think it was back right. in the States. Uh, and, and to me, you know, Twitter's been experimenting with, with video for a while. Obviously, they bought Vine. Um, the thing is that, that uh, Twitter as an as a, uh, enterprise um, has certain costs, and, and the cost of hosting video, specifically Super HD video that comes from live you know, professional broadcasts, is it, it's monumental. So for them, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's the kind of their first foray into... Uh, being able for users to be able to post videos, um, high quality videos, not just you know the vines, um, and and I think that they found a way to do that and to kind of have the advertisers pay for that uh, while it's happening instead of just saying you know let's open up the option to add video and then have a hundred million videos added onto their servers in, in one day, uh, which could be kind of tricky. So I think they're kind of working their way into it. Um, the TV clips idea is uh, I think um, like Neil said it's it's good. Um, it's it's a good way to kind of share. Uh, things together, but I don't know if it's going to actually drive interest in the same way. I'm a little bit skeptical because, for example, if you hear, if you see a tweet that someone says, "I cannot believe what I just saw on TV right now," you know, you're yeah. gonna. I think, I think I would be more likely to turn the TV on uh, to try to check and see what it was than if it was accompanied by a 10 second clip and I saw it and I said, "Ah, okay, that's yeah. not, that's not for me," you know, and then I don't waste my time with it. So, um, I, you know, in terms of the of the engagement, I think it's going to be kind of like uh, Twitter's been been heavily based on the kind of the the, the person. Sharing one to many, you know, and not really caring who it, it, you know sees it, but kind of getting it out to the audience. Uh, and in this case, following on that, you know, having the clips is uh, is is following exactly in the footsteps of what's made Twitter successful so far. So I'm sure yeah. I'm sure it's going to take off, which is pretty well. It's an interesting thing though, because uh, I was thinking about the the whole experience and how it works. So essentially, you uh, tweet about you know you see something that has happened uh, uh, during the Brits, or you retweet it, or you you watch it. But it's a very different experience than uh, what happens in sport, because uh, uh, in sports, uh, Amplify is, is quite strong in the states. Uh, they've done quite a few things with uh, sports teams and and, and television mm-hmm. networks. And in sports, I understand it more as a second screen experience, because in that sense, uh, you know, I can see somebody wanting to rewatch. Watch a goal or rewatch a certain thing that happened uh, on the pitch uh, uh, right right afterwards on, on Twitter. Uh, it's a little bit different if you are uh, talking about a musical performance because if I've just seen uh, 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 Katy Perry or if I've just seen uh, you know anybody perform on stage, 
it's quite, quite unlikely that I'm going to go back to Twitter and rewatch that same performance while I'm still watching the award show at the same time. So that feels like it's targeting almost more people that are not watching the show mm -hmm. rather than as a second screen experience. It becomes a first screen experience for people that are not watching the show at that time. And they go, mm -hmm. oh, look, somebody's posted about uh, something that's happening right now that I'm not watching. And so I'm going to go and catch up and see that performance. I don't know. It seems like a bit, it's a bit of a convoluted thought, but I hope I've expressed it to some no, uh, yeah, well said, some, well said. some clarity. And Neil, do you think that what do you well, think about I guess that? I guess there's a there's a global audience on Twitter, isn't there? Yeah, of course. Watching the show, and it's the same. You know, you, you just wonder why I was I was following the Guardian and the Enemy and Radio One and all, and they just tweet the winners that you're watching on TV. So they're obviously uh, thinking that there's an audience beyond the, the UK that don't know what's going on. Sure. Um, yeah, I could see, I, and and perhaps the perhaps there are different TV angles. Perhaps they can show something that's happening behind the scenes instead yeah. of a, an exact copy of what's what you've just seen as well. So there's there's, there's obviously uh, more dimensions to it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's gonna be interesting to see what what they're gonna do next with this type of service uh, in the music space because I I watched a few other videos and they seem they seem to be just the straight up uh, snippets of the performances rather right. than anything else or the chats that they had in between uh, that were televised. So did you uh, did you see the not to digress too far but did you see the Press Gazette report yesterday? No. Um, about a supposed allegedly uh, the Brits were sending journalists any journalist that was going to. Uh, have a free ticket to the Brits was required to tweet the name of the sponsor, Mastercard. Right. Yeah, so they, I read about that. The exact wording to uh, to to say how how great Mastercard was as a as a thank you for getting their free ticket. Yeah. I mean that was a bit of a backlash. <laughs> That was a, a backlash from MasterCard, I think, because uh, I don't think the Brits PR company had anything to do with it. It was a MasterCard's PR company that Correct. emailed that's, that's the said, yeah. yeah that emailed the journalists with a a, a number of uh, things that they should tweet. Of course, as soon as the story came out uh, and uh, a couple of journalists posted that letter, MasterCard was quick to backtrack, and I'm sure uh, right. I'm sure that the PR company probably got a, got a good telling off from that. Uh, Tony, as a community manager, you, you don't want that to happen, do you? <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, you know the idea behind. Behind, uh, the idea behind putting something in there and having, you know, I, I think for a lot of people, maybe the, the concept of having this kind of reciprocity, this forced reciprocity is, uh, is not very nice. But at the same time, you, get, you did get something for free and it's a tweet, you know, so uh, yeah. what's that really worth? You know, you tweet out something, <laughs> yeah, MasterCard's awesome. You know, I get to go to this thing for free, you know, okay, cool. <laughs> like, uh, I, so I don't, I don't, you know, I think you know, it was like, tweet afterwards. Yeah, and then you can tweet <laughs> later on, like, uh, I don't have MasterCard, I only have American Express, uh, you know, if you, it doesn't matter, you know, so uh, that, that t telling people what to say uh, giving them a template in which you know how to say something as a kind of, you know forcing them into a retweet literal retweet you know that I, I can see where people could maybe be a little bit sad about that but you know, at the end I think but it's if still it's a journalists pretty, that's yeah. I think like for journalists that's the core thing if it was just random people that they invited I mean I don't think anybody yeah, would course. be raising an eyebrow but if you're asking somebody from the independent or from you know a national paper to to do that then it yeah <laughs> uh, yeah then yeah no no no, no. Well, let me see. yeah okay you're right you're right then, right. then it doesn't quite work <laughs> I mean even I I'm, I, I try to to be pretty strict about this kind of stuff but you know <laughs> uh, yeah there's, there's definitely a gray area there that's uh, that's going on uh, but yeah so moving on from the Brits uh, it was definitely interesting and also uh, for our worldwide uh, audience uh, uh, the Brits streamed uh, live on YouTube last night were live streamed all over the world which is a first uh, I don't know the numbers yet I, I was trying to find them but I just couldn't find them in time for the show uh, but I think it's still available on demand at least partially uh, so you can go and check uh, check out the ceremony and check out what happened there uh, but I, I will try and report on the numbers of the live stream because that would be quite interesting to see if people from the states for example were uh, tuning in given the number of international acts that were performing as well and uh, uh, let's move on and talk about uh, spotify oh good old spotify we always have to talk about spotify at some point in the show and so uh, this week uh, the the news and speculation was that uh, uh, spotify is looking for a financial reporting uh, uh, specialist uh, this is uh, from a reuters report and uh, of course this led to more speculation that the company is taking in its first steps towards an IPO. So not really a surprise in the sense that the company has been around since 2006, uh, has raised uh, over $530 million in funding so far, and uh, we all know that VCs don't give their money away for free. And uh, <laughs> uh, of course, you know, they're going to want to cash out uh, sooner rather than later. But, uh, you know, of course, we've, we've just seen about uh, um, uh, WhatsApp's acquisition by Facebook for, uh, I think, 19, $19 billion. Uh, 
At 36 billion, I think, no? Is it? I think it was 19, 19? billion okay. US between uh, cash, and, cash and stocks. Wow. Which is a huge amount. Uh, Spotify's valuation right now is varies. Uh, it spans from four to eight billion dollars, depending on the analyst that's making the the analysis. Uh, and uh, you know, it's quite a big margin of error that could make for an interesting debut on the stock market, depending on where the company decides to place the value of each share, because that, of course, also affects uh, the debut of the stock and how high or how low it goes after after it comes out uh, on the market. Uh, but is it the right time for an IPO for Spotify? Of course. Uh, uh, you know, that really depends on the 2013 results, I guess. We haven't really heard much about how the company's performed over the last year. Uh, and so that's going to be a good a good barometer, I think, also to, to work out whether it's a good time for them to go public or not. Uh, Tony, do, do you think that uh, an IPO is in Spotify's sites? Uh, uh, you know, could there be any drawbacks on going public? Of course, they've been very secretive about, about numbers so far. Yeah, well, it seems like they probably wouldn't be getting someone to, to kind of handle their SEC filing if they didn't have a pretty strong Q4 of, of 2013. It seems like that might be the kind of sign uh, they're going to announce that they might have finally had a profitable quarter. And if that happens and then they, it goes onto the stock market, I think people will expect to see a little bit what they've seen from Pandora, which investors haven't seen spectacular results. But this year uh, alone, and Pandora's stock has gone through the roof. So yeah. if Spotify gets to the type of user base that uh, Pandora has, I mean, uh, you know, the amount of money that we're talking about would be significantly bigger than WhatsApp and, and uh, a lot of uh, most other apps that are, that are out there. So there's a lot of potential there right now, but uh, you know, I think we could see something that, that 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 could be that. There's a lot of reports that just came out. Generator Research had a report that just came out about how the streaming services might never be able to make money because of royalties and and things. You know, there's there's both sides of the argument here. Um, I think it really depends on if they make an announcement uh, that that they finally have have reached a profitable quarter. I think it yeah. that'll it'll all come down to that, and then that'll give people a lot of confidence to go to go behind it. Yeah, and I mean, I uh, looking at Pandora. You know, you mentioned that, and it it doesn't mean it, it doesn't have to necessarily be a profitable quarter but at least it has to be a quarter that shows that the company is steering towards profitability and not just widening widening its losses sure, uh, sure. so because like pandora you know it's, it's still not profitable and it's been on the stock market for years now so uh it, you know i guess as long as the numbers look good then you know people might be might be willing to invest in the company but they have to look good uh, neil what's your thought uh, well, it, um, I think the valuation that I saw was eight billion, wasn't it? So the numbers I've got here are twenty-four million active users for Spotify, which is a very, very healthy number. Let's face it, and they made five hundred and seventy-one million dollars in twenty twelve. Now that is that is a substantial amount of money. How they're still losing money, I'm not entirely certain, but at least there's a solid revenue stream there. Half a million dollars a year um, is is great and it's growing yeah um, I mean and those are 20 2012 numbers so we don't yeah, really know so those are the real numbers aren't they whatsapp still hasn't made that much money I don't <laughs> think uh, Twitter no. I think That's WhatsApp big. has made a, a hundred million in revenue. I think. Yeah, I mean, year, they, so. those are crazy numbers. At least Spotify has got a, a solid business underneath, or right? it has to make a profit. Um, what what might happen though is when they go uh, when they have their IPO and the shares are being traded is I just fear that what happens at Pandora might happen to Spotify, which is if if Pandora make money if if they if their shares go up too high then they are pounced upon by artists and managers who then accuse them of making too much money. It almost seems like these companies are safe as long as they make a loss because that means the artists are getting paid. As soon as they make any money or profit, they're accused of profiteering off the content. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be a very, very tricky balance for them. Yeah, and, and also uh, another point that I want to bring up is the fact that uh, as soon as the company goes public, there's a real question mark as to what's going to happen to the uh, percentages that are held by the, the labels. Because, of course, uh, uh, you know, labels are doing okay-ish, but uh, some labels are doing better than others. And if one of the majors decided to divest uh, uh, you know, the, the stake that they have in Spotify, they would stand to make a lot of money uh, after the company goes public. And at that point, there would be, a, I think, there would be a real issue as to uh, artists demanding for part of that money to actually be distributed amongst uh, the roster. Because you know, the only reason why the labels have that equity stake is because they have a strong catalog, which is given Absolutely. by the artists. And so there's a, I think it's it's a, something that hasn't really been brought up yet because none of these companies have gone public where the uh, majors have an equity stake. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens when they do and and how the artist community reacts. Yeah, precisely. Yeah.
it's, it's going to be an, an interesting time, I think, uh, this year, if Spotify goes public. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, I wanted to talk about marketing, actually, because, Neil, you're here as well. And there was an interesting piece on Hypebot, I think it was Clyde that wrote it, uh, about talking about alternative marketing and how some apparently off-the-wall ideas still require very traditional dispersion techniques to work. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, on Hypebot, uh, they, they wrote about the Chromio campaign, for example, recently, uh, they got uh, a lot of coverage uh, uh, because uh, they decided to announce their new album uh, via Craigslist, uh, and uh, you know the, the article points out that of course this was a very, really edgy you know idea, and uh, it sounds great and it's fantastic, but. Uh, it's also true that the company actually, that, that the band actually ended up tweeting the uh, the uh, the advert, uh, and uh, you know a bunch of uh, music journalists uh, got uh, to that uh, uh, you know uh, advertisement uh, on Craigslist, and they ended up writing about it, and so it made a big story in the press. So maybe not quite as uh, uh, genuine as somebody just stumbling into the story on Craigslist and actually making it a big story. Uh, you know, in, in a sense. Uh, it's uh, it, the Nine Inch Nails story where they actually started the whole campaign a few years back by uh, leaving a USB in a bathroom of their, of their uh, uh, gig. That, that was a lot more genuine in the sense that the, the fan actually found that file and ended up uh, posting it online and that kind of kicked off the whole campaign. So uh, I, I don't know, uh, uh, Neil, uh, on your side, uh, do you find that sometimes these uh, uh, off the wall ideas for marketing do need a traditional push and thus making them less genuine than, than they should uh, uh, really be? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's one of the mainstays of digital marketing is to find a digital first. You find a world first, um, which is easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've been doing it for years. You find a world first and you get more publicity by doing that than you do uh, from the traditional marketing, if you like. So I, I, I think these things have... Uh, have and, and let's bear in mind that the, the record business itself has always been about um, hype, you know, putting Michael Jackson, big statue down the Thames. You know, it's, it's, it's always been about coming up with a, a plot, a ploy to grab journalists' attention. It, if putting something on Craigslist grabs journalists' attention, that is exactly what the industry has been doing for years and years. It's not really any different. Yeah, yeah. Tony? Well, you know, I mean, I would just expect, I guess, the next artist to, uh, you know, announce a new album in the Yelp review or perhaps uh, an OK Cupid <laughs> profile, you know. Uh, yeah. Obviously, the digital first is it's a very good point. You get that you get that first you know, first new. Those are those are those are good words. You know, when talking to journalists, uh, I'm just a little a little nervous about uh, now. You know, if a hundred, a thousand other artists start flooding Craigslist with uh, you know with with posts because you know it's kind of like you know someone breaks ground a little bit and then they start going onto these different places where there there's an audience, but they might not necessarily be fans. Yeah. Um, and a place that's not really designed for music. So. Uh, generally speaking, you know, will will we see more types of this stuff? I, I don't know, but uh, but but as far as the Craigslist option goes, I mean, Craigslist is already just a ton of random shit. So I guess like you know, a Chromio <laughs> album that kind of qualifies to me as random shit. So I, I kind of uh, kind of fits there a little bit, I guess. So I'm looking forward to listening to it. I haven't listened. Yeah, to it, so. exactly. It probably doesn't raise an eyebrow, uh, but uh, it's <laughs> interesting actually. You know, uh, you're talking about a platform that is not made for really a. a, a community communication and and that maybe was a mistake in the sense that maybe reddit w would be a much better choice to do something like that I, I, i'm sure somebody has already done it on reddit because it's such a big community but uh, uh you know the fact that it encourages conversations that definitely makes it a, an interesting platform to to debut something like that on but you'd need a pretty nerdy audience to actually uh, ca catch on to that well you know they, they, yeah the guess the, the nerds always adapt first so you know and, and at least in the tech world so you know getting on reddit would be would be a good thing craig this just doesn't have any sort of lateral movement you know you don't have you don't really have a Craigslist profile and, and you don't you can't move it in between things on Craigslist so it kind of would sit there but you know what's the difference between it sitting at a URL from Craigslist or just a URL from from your own website exactly know? I'm already thinking of like more interesting things they could have done like setting up some sort of a Twilio hack where people could call <laughs> And uh, leave a message for the advert, and then they could collate all the messages and make something cool with it. But I, yeah. I, I'm 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 digressing here. <laughs> <laughs> we can spend all day brainstorming. Yeah, like yeah exactly. Yeah, that could have been some really cool things that could have been done that's there. Uh, and 
but uh, you know, if you want to read more about the article for the audience, of course, uh, I'm going to put that in the show notes. Uh, there's going to be a link in the uh, show as always. Uh, and uh, uh, you can find all the links to the stories that we're going to talk about today uh, on that uh, spreadsheet, which is a, a very sexy little spreadsheet that I make every week. And so uh, there's a few stories, international stories this week that I, I love to cover because uh, I love covering uh, international uh, digital music developments. And so a couple of interesting, interesting stories about Russia. So uh, first up, uh, there was an interesting uh, declaration by the uh, sort of statement by the head of the FBI, uh, Francis Moore, uh, who in an opinion piece published by CMU, targeted a Russian uh, social network Vcontact as a company that could do a lot more to promote legal music content in the territory. And that was actually followed by another uh, uh, um, uh, statement uh, from the US government uh, uh, around Vcontact who, who was named uh, just this week uh, amongst the worst piracy offenders and that was reported by the Music Industry Network. And so uh, a double fronted attack from the US and the UK on uh, Vcontact uh, and uh, more rights uh, about Vcontact's uh, uh, potential for uh, an IPO because it's something that apparently the network is looking at uh, and you know, uh, you know and uh, she says she writes Vcontact should not wait for an IPO to seize uh, this opportunity opportunity to become essentially legal and promote legal content. You should act now, take steps to stop facilitating piracy and become a licensed participant in the music business. So, uh, of course, uh, you know, Moore also acknowledges that uh, in Russia things are changing when it comes to the government's stance on piracy and there are new laws being put in place. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, first up, let's talk about Vcontact. You know, it's a, it's a social network. It's a network that's been often accused of, of, accused of uh, uh, piracy. You know, where do you think, uh, how far do you think the government can go, Neil, in, in curbing uh, piracy on a social network that's privately owned in Russia? I've been following this site for a couple of years, actually, because one of my students was uh, is Russian. Uh, right. And he invited me to set up uh, an account about 18 months ago. So Great. it's something I've been following for quite a while. I mean, it's, it's ridiculously... Uh, for, for anyone who's who's familiar with BitTorrent or LimeWire and Kazar, I mean, it's it's a social network built on free sharing of, of any content you upload, and it's right. so blatant. I mean, they don't do anything to hide it whatsoever. <laughs> um, the, the guy in my class says that everyone in Russia uses it. Um, the, the guys who founded it are already millionaires. Uh, I think there's new management being bought in. But these guys have already made their money. And the problem is that for every, if, if this does go legit, another one will take its place. Um, the, Russia um, and other countries, if, if they are serious about copyright, they, then it's the government that has to start cracking down because it's all very well them you know their citizens becoming millionaires on the back of western content and i know that's a gross generalization but it does seem you know it, it is very grating very galling for services over here yeah who just yeah. can't compete in those markets because someone else is being allowed to give it away yeah absolutely and uh, uh tony on, on your end uh, you know do, do you is there anything remotely comparable in france in terms of a an alternative social network uh no no there's a, there are some little networks uh, that are out there but uh, but there's nothing really compared with with VK uh you know there's I think there's a French version of VK and uh, it's 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 kind of like the Vladimir Putin of of social networks I mean it's uh, it's very big quite powerful and uh doesn't really like to follow <laughs> what anybody else tells him to do um but it's so blatant like Neil said yeah. it's just it's so blatant uh, you know that's that uh, you you kind of wonder um you know why governments aren't doing more to block it outside of Russia knowing that it is there, there are still Russians outside of Russia who use it as a regular social network yeah. uh, as an alternative to Facebook so but but then then uh, you know I think the government in Russia has started to change a little bit there was that uh, link that you sent us Andrea from the the tracks flow I believe yeah. um, where they actually got mm -hmm. a ruling uh, down from the court that was quite severe in the way that uh, tracks flow was violating copyright uh, and and they potentially are going to even lose their domain name um, which I think would have been a first so there's I think there's hope on the horizon but uh, challenging something of this size is just uh, it's going to be difficult especially with with international uh, reach and like Neil said you're going to have another one that kind of pops up so uh, I think the biggest argument towards them changing the way that they're doing things is is that there were some statistics uh, that they're they're heavily depressing the Russian music market uh, because of because of the piracy across the network, so maybe there could be a little bit of a kind of sympathetic push, uh, you know, from Russian musicians saying, "Hey, guys, it's not just you know we're not just stealing rich white you know uh, Western music, uh, you know we're stealing from us too." 
So yeah. maybe that could eventually cause a little tide to, to shift in, in the future. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, uh, I, I'm hearing contrast, like uh, conflicting reports from Russia as well, because um, when I interviewed uh, uh, Denis Ladigayeri, uh, who's the CEO of Believe, uh, um, at Medium uh, just a few weeks ago, he said that Russia is actually, uh, you know, a market that's doing really, really well for them, uh, mm. uh, thanks to iTunes. Since iTunes debuted in the country, uh, they have seen like a massive uh, lift in sales. And I think they have a team of five now in place in, in Moscow uh, dealing with the with the Russian operation. So uh, I guess like the presence of iTunes has lifted the market in a sense, uh, but uh, uh, there's still a lot to be done when it comes to, to uh, Caribbean piracy. And I mean, I, I remember from, you know, from t so time immemorial, like way before I came to the UK, we're talking about 14, 13 years ago, there were already Russian sites that were offering uh, mp3s for ridiculous prices and as a as a teenager you were thinking oh this is great i can get like you know five albums for two dollars and uh, mm -hmm. i think I, I even subscribed for you know a couple of months to something like that uh, when i was uh, uh, maybe 16 or 17 uh, but you know it, you quickly realize that it's not legit and so <laughs> music doesn't go for that cheap uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 thankfully actually yeah. uh, but uh, um uh, so that was a Russian story, actually. Uh, thanks, uh, Tony, for mentioning the uh, the tracks for one. Uh, that was uh, uh, another one that I wanted to mention, and uh, uh, we'll see what happens with them. Uh, and uh, the other story that was international that I wanted to talk about was uh, about uh, uh, India. Uh, so the rumors around uh, Dingana's demise had been around for a while. Uh, it, I, I spoke to a couple of people from India uh, earlier this month, and uh, uh, they said that, in their opinion, the service was already gone. But I guess it hadn't gone gone, because uh, uh, this week uh, the service actually it changed its homepage from the service to a goodbye message, which was uh, essentially just a blank page with a super simple HTML text saying, uh, we hope you enjoy listening to Dingana as much as we enjoy building it and everything else. Uh, you know, Dingana is, uh, was the biggest streaming service in India. And so its, uh, it's uh, demise uh, sort of opens, uh, paves the way for uh, competitors like Ghana.com uh, and uh, also uh, Savna to uh, become uh, bigger. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, uh, Neil, I know you had, uh, you know, you, you worked in Asia for a while. Uh, so, do you have any uh, inside tracks on what's happened with the uh, Dingana uh, and and whether it was just uh, the writing was on the wall already, and this was just a, an actuation of something that was already in the works? Uh, well, they're, they're the second big Indian service to go down this year, and I'm desperately trying to remember the name of the other one. But there was there was another one uh, about 12 months ago that that uh, closed. Um, Ghana and Savan are they the their business models are they they look fundamentally flawed. They they are on the surface they just look like these VC plays that are trying to attract as many users as they can. Excuse me. <coughs> By get, the, the music is given away for free. Yep. That's not to say that they are in the VK class because they licensed music. They do actually gain a license from the rights holders, but then they, they allow unlimited free streaming. Um, and the only way that can be paid for is through venture capital money, right. um, who are hoping to attract so many users to the service that they can then start monetizing through either advertising or, or, or additional services. And, and of course, it's flawed. You know, it's, it's, it's just a flawed model. It's, it's where the Internet was, you know, 10 years ago. And, and uh, we saw the destruction happen there. Um, it's, it's happening in India now. There's, it's, it's the, the people out there. I was at a party. I was, I happened to be in Mumbai at new year, um, at a new year's Eve party and everyone played, used YouTube. Yeah. They, they use YouTube. They don't use the local services. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a tough market to crack. Definitely, uh, yeah. It's a it's a very fascinating market because it's so huge, but the revenues are not are not quite there yet. Uh, no. uh, and, and Tony, from from a, from a wide perspective, a wide perspective, <coughs> have you have you looked into India in case there were any interesting services for you guys to integrate? Yeah, actually, we had uh, we had evaluated um, the big four. Uh, I think the only one we hadn't mentioned was Angana. Um, yeah. if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, who's still around now? And uh, we had looked at uh, at the possibility of integrating different platforms. We didn't really want to have too much of an overlap uh, between some of the other platforms that we that we host, like uh, like Deezer. For for example, which we just integrated, um, but uh, Savan was the one that I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that completely, completely wrong. Savan, I say yeah. Savan, but I think yeah, Savan. Savan. I think you're right. That sounds good. Um, yeah, that was actually the most interesting to us because of its focus on actual Indian music. 
uh, which yeah. is something that is not nearly as present on uh, on the, the other platforms that are kind of spreading right around the world. So uh, we had looked at that as a possible option um, and as a kind of entry point into India um, and making that service a little bit more widely available to um, a wider audience that's outside of India. Um, I'm not sure what the numbers are between the different services, uh, who who's the biggest um, in there, but uh, it seems to me like there was four big players in a, in a relatively small market already. Which obviously India is gigantic, but the streaming numbers are still, uh, you know, are still pretty small. And like you said, YouTube is kind of uh, cannibalizing everything from the bottom up. So and maybe it's just maybe it's just this might be just kind of phase one of a little consolidation where you know it goes it turns into three players, and then maybe in a year you see a merger, and then yeah. you know one of the one of them emerges uh, emerges on on, on top. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's yeah. going to be a market that moves really quickly as well because uh, right now, for example, the OV Music Store, from what I heard, is still huge because uh, Nokia's got such a stronghold on, on, on the uh, uh, device distribution as well in, in, in India because of the low-cost devices too. So mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting to see as uh, uh, new, cheaper smartphones start flooding the market, uh, how that affects uh, the, the adoption of streaming services and who wins essentially in this, uh, in, the, in this kind of race. It's, yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's a wide-open market. I think you know, the, majority, the vast majority of the digital uh, revenue Revenues in India are coming from ringtones right now, so it's it's actually a big market, uh, but it's uh, a market that we've seen here in Europe fade pretty quickly as soon as uh, the devices uh, started sort of surpassing the, the need to have, uh, you know, expensive ringtones that you have to download to your phone. So if that follows, you know, if, if India follows this pattern, hopefully streaming services will come in and start substituting some of that revenue if it starts slowing down uh, from ringtones and it's going to be an interesting one to watch I think mm -hmm. uh, and talking about you know we're talking about a uh, local catalog Tony and, uh, 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 and I'm going to make like a fantastic leap a segue which never works when you point it out but uh, uh, that's essentially you know the the uh, issue that we're talking about on the panel that I'm, I'm hosting at South by Southwest Music we're talking about local approaches to international markets uh, uh, with local catalogs which is a problem for big services that are expanding into 20, 30 territories at a time and don't have the time to actually go and make the licenses with uh, uh, the right labels and partners in, uh, in, in, the, in the right territories. So I want to talk about South By because they announced yesterday something that has got nothing to do with local territories because it's uh, as a as globalized as as possible essentially uh, which is the iTunes festival announcing five yeah. uh, uh, dates uh, at uh, uh, South by Southwest so between the 11th and the 15th of March uh, uh, the iTunes festival for the first time is going to leave London and uh, head to the US it's good timing because it's six months uh, uh, after the London event so it's a good spread between the two uh, it's only five nights, so of course it's a lot less uh, cumbersome than the month-long uh, London event, which happens actually just uh, uh, about uh, 600, 700 meters uh, down the road from where I am right now recording. Uh, and... Uh, um uh, you know, as it's going to be available to Southwest Southwest Music and Platinum Batch holders uh, as a draw. So you're going to have to physically go to the to the conference center and uh, enter in this draw. There might be a few tickets going out for contests. I'm, I'm pretty sure that there will be, uh, but mm -hmm. I think the majority are going to be awarded to uh, badge holders. Uh, and I think it's an interesting thing. You know, they, they have massive bands already lined up: Coldplay, Imagine Dragons, uh, Keith Urban, Zed, Pitbull, Willie Nelson, and, and more to be revealed soon. And it's a very interesting move from Apple because. It kind of feels like they are finally, they finally feel the need to uh, have a presence at one of the biggest, you know, live music events in the world, in, in order to also, in in a, in a sense, substantiate the fact that they're not declining, <laughs> as far <laughs> as far as you know, as far as downloads are concerned. Because you know, in in the states, with the rise of streaming, it, it look, you know, for the first time last year, we saw a a, a decline in 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 um, in the sale of uh, single tracks. So. Uh, yeah, that's kind of an interesting move. I, I wonder whether that was driven by, uh, you know, a need for iTunes to really make a make a mark in the states and say, you know, we're still here, you know, we're fantastic, and look at what kind of great bands we can bring to the table. Uh, but Tony, do you think that that could have been a factor in, in their deciding to make such a brush, you know, such a bold move at South by South by Southwest, bringing in world class acts and spending presumably a huge amount of money doing so? Well, you know, I. I, I... Feel there's a couple. There's two points to make here. Number one right. is that uh, yes, they're 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 facing some problems because iTunes Radio hasn't particularly uh, been painted in the best light uh, as a good as a viable option or, or you know alternative to Pandora yet. It's just not that's not established enough. I think they just opened in, in Australia uh, like a couple of weeks ago. It's just their second market. Uh, so they're they're they have a problem with MP3 downloads, but I think they also have a problem with with the image. It's it, iTunes was never a sexy place. Where you discovered new music, iTunes is where you stored your music. It was like your your that was it. It was your storage space. They tried, you know, there's some genius functionality which would help you find music that you already had, 
so I think that they also need to kind of establish their their positioning as a kind of cultural uh, place too, you know, and and uh, that's probably why they're trying to focus in on South by Southwest because now South by Southwest is so huge that they're able to touch pretty much everybody in the music business um, in North America at least um, for uh, albeit a small period of time. I think it's kind of a shame um, because it's going to draw away attention from what South by Southwest is all about, which is you know uh, innovation, uh, interactivity, um, new, new you know, bands. New bands, yeah. I mean, p bands that people haven't heard of yet. Getting, you know, that for them, you know, that they might have played a couple of shows, uh, and South by South Southwest is their their dream gig. You know, they're really excited about it. And now you're going to have like, you know, pit bulls, limos, like driving around the town, and uh, you know, it really it, it kind of moves to a different level. When iTunes doesn't really back that up because all they did was was basically create like they used the genius and and uh, to put it into a radio uh, for songs that you now that you don't necessarily have to yeah. present that to you. So they didn't really, you know, if they had come out with some sort of crazy awesome new music interactive thing that you know it senses your ear direction i don't know you know if they were doing something like that that people could test uh if they were supporting bands i mean i would have preferred to see you know itunes pick up like a hundred bands or a thousand bands for the probably the, the, the cost that they're paying you know to bring in these big acts you know pick up these bands and, and help to make you know make new artists and, and and give new artists a shot you know really amplify what uh, what south by southwest is about instead of just kind of overshadow yeah. Um, there, so I, I have to say I'm a little, little bummed about it when I saw that news, is because I, I, I love Coldplay, love Willie Nelson, love all the, all the bands, um, not so much Pitbull, but you know I, I, I enjoy all the music. It's just South by Southwest is kind of the wrong place. Yeah. You kind of you would expect that in like the Meadowlands or something, you know. Yeah, you're absolutely stealing words from my mouth. I mean that's that's uh, that's been happening for years, I guess. Uh, uh, as uh, you know, it always uh, it's always a last minute thing. You know, we're only about two and a half weeks away from the festival, and uh, you know this always seems to be huge acts that are announced uh, at the very last minute. This st starts stealing the show a little bit from from the unsigned bands. Uh, and uh, uh, Neil, from from your side, do you think Apple missed the trick not to have maybe like a couple of headline acts? But but maybe promote you know have a whole afternoon and have a bunch of uh, smaller uh, bands that they, they could have helped break essentially through the festival. Um, no 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 because I, I again I've got two points like Tony one is uh, he said at South by has become so huge so to do something like this at South by is is almost uh, expected now because it's yeah. the the focus of the world's media is is on this small. Uh, city, relatively small city for uh, for a couple of weeks, and you know you get very bored if you're not there, reading all the tweets and Facebook updates from from the people who are, because they will they will make sure that you know that they're there. So that, that so for two weeks it, it dominates the headlines. So I can see why why they they would choose to do it. But the, the, you've said a few times, um, you know the 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 size of the artists, you know Coldplay, Elton John, Justin Timberlake. Lady Gaga, the the world's biggest artist, and that is just a sign that iTunes, after so many years, is still the dominant force when it comes to music. That when they say we're going to have a festival and we want the biggest bands, the record labels, the managers, uh, the promote, they all have to jump. They all have to bow down and kowtow to Apple because they are still 60-70% of the retail market. And it's a ridiculous situation that one company is still so dominant in this space. Um, I, I, as you can see, I, I do get quite flustered and angry about the fact that this company are still so dominant after such a long time. All the artists have to, have to be there because it means homepage placement, global homepage placement. On, on iTunes. Yeah. So that's, they have that's to very be, valuable. I mean, they have to be there. They haven't got a choice. As we've seen yeah. with Beyonce, that, that the global front page placement can be an incredibly valuable when it comes to yeah. sales. <laughs> yeah, and if you want it, then guess what? You're going to have to play at our festival. Yeah. The, 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 the quote from Apple was from their senior vice president of internet software. Not yeah. music. Not the Medicare, right? Not yeah. they're, they're vice president of internet software. That's how much they. They care about the music. It's a way to sell internet software. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's about time. I, I love Apple. I'm yeah. talking to you on a Mac. I've got my iPad. I've got my iPad. I've nothing against Apple products. I Most of my disposable iTunes, income goes to Apple. <laughs> iTunes needs to be bought down a, a peg or two. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> no, I'm not going to get a job at, uh, at iTunes now, am I? 
<laughs> I'm not gonna get get well, into any of the gigs now. That's what's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be fun. Uh, no, no, it's 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 uh, it's well said, and you know, all good points and. Uh, uh, you know, as you said, you know, it's becoming just this huge thing. You know, last year there were so many uh, sort of backs and forth from people that were, you know, for example, didn't like the Dorito stage. It was a huge packet of Dorito right in the middle of, of, of South by. They thought the branding was too too brash. So it's going to be interesting to see this year how that plays out and uh, whether it gets even bigger on brands or whether it stays at around the same level and, and, and what happens uh, around that. Uh, and well, I think, uh, uh, you know, there were a couple more stories that uh, were interesting this week, uh, but... Uh, uh, I think we're gonna save them for next week, actually, because it's already th- we're recording actually a day later than usual. So uh, and <laughs> let me just go through uh, and ch- oh, actually, there's another thing that I want to talk about about South by. Sorry, uh, I- I'm so disorganized today. Uh, it's been it's been a long week. I was in, I was in Germany actually Monday and Tuesday at uh, the Social Media Week in Hamburg. It was quite interesting. Uh, I did a couple of panels with the German distributors talking about the future of music in Germany and sort of the dominance of physical and stuff like that. So that was quite eye opening to nice. realize when when physical is so strong how how difficult it is to push and and break digital services on on, the, on that side because everything revolves around the release campaign but uh, uh, sorry enough about that I, i'm digressing again i wanted to talk about the uh, south by southwest music hackathon uh, which uh, has just been announced uh, well it, it's it's a very new thing i hadn't seen anything about this yet but apparently it's happening and since i've covered uh, hackathons before i wanted to point that out uh, so uh, this is called the south by southwest music hackathon championship uh, and uh, it, uh, the site says well the best minds in music and technology come together to reinvent the music business for artists, bands and fans. Uh, 24 hour period like usual for hackathons and then there's going to be a championship awards show as happens and this is on the Wednesday the 12th. The interesting thing about this is that there's actually another hackathon that is happening on the same day as far as I can tell uh, which is hosted by Slash and it's called the Slashathon. And it's essentially a very similar concept, but it's just hosted by Slash and it's in a different venue as far as I understand. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, lots of hackers are going to be around South by. So uh, I don't know, Tony, do you think this is a bit late to the game? I mean, I've been going to uh, Music Hack Days since 2009. And it's kind of interesting to see that only only this year we're starting to see a, a hackathon happening at South by for music. Yeah, it's uh, it's a great thing, though. I mean, it's, oh, it's amazing. Right. It's, yeah, it's, it's great. not the first. It's not the first. Uh, yeah, it's, they're a little bit late to the party. It, it seemed to me like South by Southwest would have had hack, it would have started as a hackathon, you know, kind of. But yeah, uh, yeah that, there's there's also a lot of organization that comes out of it because music, uh, you know, hackathons are nice for building little products and stuff like that. But when you bring it to the level of South by Southwest, uh, which again has gotten so huge now, if someone creates a product that you know incidentally infringes upon rights, or you know, music is after all a very a very complex web of things, and so you have to be kind of careful that you're not going to give the prize to somebody who figured out a way to you know go around the system too. So there's, I, I think it would be cool to have to have the two together. I mean, why not? Um, I, I guess you could have as many hackathons as you want because it's kind of broken down into teams. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see if people come up with the same idea from the separate hackathons. Um, and maybe they isolate some kind of new needs. But for me, the, I, I love the hackathons. I think that that's one of the best things possible is just, it, you know, this, this rapid expression of creativity uh, that, that just gives birth to so many eventual ideas. So, yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm all for it. I can't wait to see what, the, what they come up with. It's going to be great. I mean, what I'm, what I'm really excited about is the fact that uh, hackathons that happen at music events have a different relevancy to the industry in the sense that I've been going to the Medium uh, Hack Day, for example, mm-hmm. uh, which was sort of a strand of the music hack day, but done at Medium with a, a smaller number of hackers. And that seems to have really, over the last f- of four years that it's been running, uh, four or five, I think four or five, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, over the last few years where it's been running, it's really convinced uh, uh, a much broader uh, a section of a portion of the industry as to the importance of developers and what they can do and the importance of APIs and what can be done you know, by mash up different services and all the fun stuff and, and so you know from from a first year where they were seen as sort of with a, with a bit of diffidence and it was a small thing and people were still looking at hackers as sort of like these uh, uh, naughty people and yeah. you know p- pirates and, and all that it's really changed the perception of uh, hackers at medium and, and what they do uh, f- and developers essentially so uh, south by just gives you that much bigger of a platform to do the same thing at so depending on what kind of uh, uh, echo that has within the within the, the event itself it could be like a really amazing thing uh, Neil, what do you think about uh, uh, South by Hackton? Well, uh, obviously, I echo the fact that it's uh, a great idea. I just um, uh, recount a quick story when I met a couple of hackers a few years ago at Medem, 
um, and a, a couple of them were coming back and they, they were telling me that they were part of this group and they were doing university degree courses in degree in technology and music. I thought, well, you know, how fabulous. But they said, uh, you know, the, the, the fact was they had to keep everything so under the ground because they knew that if any of the applications that they come up with ever surfaced or could be traced to them or started making money, they would get crushed by the license demands. Um, and and I'm, I'm glad you said that after four years, the record labels are gradually beginning to realize that if you crush that innovation, um, you know, they're, they're just going to go elsewhere. And it, it's, it's taken a long time to get to this point where people now realize that this is an essential component of the new industry. We're not going to evolve if these kids aren't coming up with these crazy ideas. But if you crush them, the moment that their app starts making money or say that to get a license, it's going to be $10 million advance, then then it's not going to, then we're going to be stuck with that. Then we go back to iTunes is always going to be the number one store. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to argue about that again. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. you know, it's, it's interesting to, to see also the, the services that are providing uh, APIs to access uh, uh, for for developers to access, for example, the the Medium Hackathon was uh, you know Hack Day was uh, sponsored by both uh, Deezer and Spotify, and they both had representatives there uh, that were essentially developer evangelists, you know, or, or you know a platform evangelists. Uh, we're talking about technology side of things and getting developers to use their API to create cool new stuff. So definitely a push there from services to see more integration uh, with uh, uh, other services or third party apps uh, and encourage more people, I guess, to pay for the premium side of things because most of these uh, uh, apps that uh, integrate uh, the likes of Deezer and Spotify require a premium subscription to, for access on mobile. So that definitely bolsters the numbers on that uh, on that front. Uh, well, I think that was pretty much it, but I would uh, love to hear uh, what you guys are up to uh, before we leave. So uh, uh, Neil, do you want to start? Uh, what, what are you working on at the moment and anything you want to plug, uh, please do. Well, Valium, Valium is still um, still uh, the, the thing I'm working on. That's the distribution in Southeast Asia. We're now Fantastic. looking very much. Yeah, we're, we're now looking very, uh, very closely into the multi-channel network opportunities out in Southeast Asia. So I expect us to start looking for a lot more channels, um, sign building, building channels over in uh, particularly Philippines and Indonesia. So that's that's the big focus right now. That's great. And so you're going to look looking at more travels as well? I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Yeah, get to the sun. Yeah, get away from the rain. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And uh, Antonio, on your front, uh, you know, of, of course, uh, if you want to uh, sort of uh, in, in, uh, give us a 20 second, 30 second introduction as to what wide is, oh, and yeah, then sure. I guess people can go and check it out uh, uh, in, in, uh, at home. Yeah, sure. It's uh, I mean, Wide has uh, we we created it as a way for uh, for people who really enjoy music to kind of keep all of their uh, tracks in one place, and 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 over time we've kind of developed it into the social network uh, that that replaces uh, the need to share music on Facebook and 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 find people that have similar tastes in music, and so it's it's kind of become a, a collection, a record collection, if you will, uh, for the streaming era. So we've integrated with a lot of different services. We'll be doing uh, more soon. We've got a mobile app which uh, we just did the first beta test uh, on Tuesday with uh, some, some test users here. So that should be out in, uh, in, in the near future. So a lot, of, a lot of exciting things coming from Wide. I mean, it, I'd love to have everybody uh, come and take a look and, and, and let me know what you think. Uh, what and that's on Wide.com, right? Yep, wide.com, exactly. Perfect. Awesome. Well, right. guys, it was a real pleasure having you on. It was a really fun show to record. So thanks so much. Thanks yeah, thanks, Andrew. It and was a pleasure. And thanks so much for listening to DNT. Of course, the show comes out uh, every week. You can find out more on digitalmusictrends.com. And uh, thanks again to CI for sponsoring this week's show on ci-info.com. Uh, have a fantastic week and until uh, next time. Trends.